Open your Bibles with me, if you would, please, to 2 Samuel, chapter 23. 2 Samuel, chapter 23. And we'll look at verses 1 and 2 here in just a second. But the Bible, and especially the Old Testament, is not written in strict chronological order. However, there is a rhyme to the reason even of the Old Testament. The entire Old Testament record is contained within the first 17 books. You can make the case, actually. It's contained in the first 16 books, and you would insert Esther back in to the time frame contained in Ezra, but that's neither here nor there. The first five books of the Old Testament are books of law, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and the next 12 books are of Hebrew history, Joshua through Esther, and the remaining 22 inspired and preserved books of the Old Testament basically occurred at various points during the time frame of the first 17, really the first 16. However, Malachi might be the exception. Malachi could very well be the last piece of the Old Testament canon that was inspired and preserved. If not that, it was probably Nehemiah, but that's neither here nor there. Now, despite not writing the entire book of Psalms, David, the second king of the United Kingdom of Israel, was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write many of the individual Psalms, probably more than 70, if not a good bit more than that. If you have a favorite Psalm, there's a very high probability that David is the inspired writer. How do I know that? Well, let's look at 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 and 2, and listen to what the Bible says. 2 Samuel 23, 1, now these be the last words of David. Last words here probably refers to the last bit of inspired revelation delivered by David. It wasn't like these were the last literal words that came out of his mouth and then he fell over dead. That could be, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Now these be the last words of David, the last inspired and delivered words of his. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me. That's what he said. What's he claiming? He's claiming to be an inspired man. And his word was in my tongue. Every member of the Lord's church and even the regular visitors need to know this term. Plenary verbal inspiration. Every word of the Bible is God breathed. David is affirming that at least at points and times in his life, he did not write his own words. He spoke what the Holy Spirit led him to say and to write. So we can know that if we read any of the Psalms, especially by David, what can we go back to? Either he told the truth or he lied. Which one do you believe he did? Do you believe he told the truth? I believe he told the truth. So David is the sweet psalmist of Israel. He did not write fairy tales and he did not write fabrications. So let's talk tonight about David. And we're going to talk about David from the aspect of him being the sweet psalmist of Israel. I don't know if you figured it out yet, but we're going to be in the book of Psalms tonight, even though we're talking about kings of the United Kingdom. We want to do four things in as quick and efficient manner as possible tonight with regard to David being the sweet psalmist of Israel. We're going to look at four different psalms, and they are ascribed to David, and we're going to see what we can learn from these very quickly. So first, we're going to talk about David and how he wrote psalms of creation. Look at me in Psalm 8. The Psalms, though it's, I don't reckon you'll lose your soul and burn into devil's hell if you talk about Psalm chapter 8 and Psalm chapter this, but they're really not chapters in the strictest and literalist, I guess if that's a word, most literal sense of a chapter. They're individual Psalms and they were composed over a, perhaps even as many as a thousand years and they were collected together we don't know by who, but perhaps it was Ezra, perhaps it was someone along those lines, but we know that they're given by inspiration of God. Now, before really digging in to this psalm or any other, it seems necessary to mention something about the ancient, ancient, perhaps you want to say, titles prefacing the respective psalms. When the inspired writers started writing the various psalms, the Holy Spirit probably did not have them compose Psalm 8 to the chief musician, Upon Giddeth, a psalm of David. So when David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to record what we know as Psalm 8, he probably didn't write that first. All right, but there's something that we have to say. Despite these ancient 
titles being uninspired, I don't know of any that are incorrect. For example, Jesus quotes Psalm 110.1 and attributes it to David. And when we get there and look at Psalm 110, the accompanying title to Psalm 110 says, A Psalm of David. So though this title probably is not inspired by the Holy Spirit, it's still correct. Now, let me give you a simple breakdown of Psalm 8. Verses 1 through 4 are about the divinity of God. And verses 5 through 9 are about the dignity of man. So David wrote Psalms of Creation. Let's see what David understood that perhaps we still need to understand today. Look at Psalm 8, verse 3, beginning. When I, that's David, when I consider thy heavens. Who created the heavens? David attributes them to the Lord, doesn't he? When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, showing the intricate detail and design in the universe. But what's he talking about? When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars. Seems that David perhaps spent a good amount of time outside underneath the stars. And perhaps we'll talk more about that next time. Which thou hast ordained, what is man? That thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him. Now David was not confused regarding the origin of the universe. He knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jehovah created all things, the Latin phrase or however you want to look at it, ex nihilo, that is out of nothing. There was nothing from a material standpoint. God spoke and here it is. So how did all things come to be? God spoke them into existence. And David said, when I lay out under what seems to be the night sky and I look up, he begins to ponder these things. He looks at the moon and the stars which the Lord has ordained and he says, who am I? What is man? Why do you pay attention to me in view of all this? What are we? What was David? Well, look also at verse number five. For thou hast made him. Now in the context, what is it? It's man. God made man. So where did man get his dignity? We got it from God. Have you ever thought about why we don't pick fleas off each other? Why don't we pick, pick stuff out of our hair and eat it once we pick it out like other animals do? Why don't we do that? Now, there may be people that do that. I can't say as I've ever really seen anybody do that like an animal. But why don't we do those kind of things? Because God didn't make us that way. He gave us dignity. For thou hast made him a little lower, a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now David also knew where humanity came from. Where did we come from? Do we evolve from a single-celled amoeba out of the ocean? Millions or billions? I don't even know. How, however kind of time frame they put on where humanity came from. But what does David say? God created all things, man is a thing, and he understood that God made us. So when we look back at the Psalms of David, we see that David wrote Psalms of creation. And we need to remember where we came from because if we'll help, it'll help us to know where we're going if we know where we've come from. Now second, David also wrote Psalms of comfort. Look with me in Psalm 23. Psalm 23. In the darkest hours of sorrow and heartache, Psalm 23 has provided comfort and consolation to countless individuals for many, many years, and I suspect it will continue to do so for as long as God permits the earth to remain. Ever wonder why Psalm 23 is almost always involved in funeral services? Have you ever thought about that? If the preacher doesn't say it or whoever gets up and says something, whether it's in the building, graveside, wherever it is, has it ever, have you ever really thought about that? Why? Well, there are several reasons that perhaps could be given, but one of the things that sticks out to me is the constant use of personal pronouns. You say, well, what is that? Look at all those I, me, my, mine, and we can relate with that. The Lord is my shepherd. I understand he's your shepherd. I, I got that. I understand he's David's shepherd, but put yourself there. The Lord is whose shepherd? He's my shepherd. I shall not want. Right? Indeed so. 
Simple breakdown of Psalm 23, really you could look at every verse. You could look at every verse as a point, but here's a simple breakdown. Verses 1 through 4, Jehovah protects. Verses 5 and 6, Jehovah provides. Well, let's look at Psalm 23 in verse number 4. Yea, though I. Now, I understand that's David, but it helps, it helps me anyway put myself there. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? When you see four, say why. Why? Why will you fear no evil? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort. It doesn't say you. I understand it would comfort you, but it says me, doesn't it? Now, troublesome times will also befall the faithful children of God, but unlike the hireling who flees when things get tough, John chapter 10 and verse number 12, where does the Lord stand? He says in Psalm 23 and verse 4, For thou art with me. The Lord doesn't run off when things get difficult. Where is he? He's right there with us. Now, we may not think about that. We may forget that from time to time. But you see the beauty of the Psalms and how David wrote Psalms of comfort. Look at verses 5 and 6. What does the text say? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow who? It says me. Shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? He said forever. Now God still provides abundant nourishment and peace even in the presence of our enemies. Let that sink in just for a minute. Let that sink in. We can and we indeed do have a measure of comfort in this life, but where will our greatest comfort? When will we actually attain our greatest comfort? It will be in the life to come, won't it? And that's what we need to keep in our minds. There's something better than this life that awaits us on the other side. What's our duty here? Be faithful to the Lord. Do what he says. We can have a measure of comfort here, but we're really striving to attain the true and lasting and eternal comfort. Now third, David also wrote Psalms of Confession. Turn me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is one of the greatest examples of of the confession of personal sin in all of Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, go before this, go after this. But here's the fact. Good men and bad men have at least one thing in common. Guess what it is? It's sin. Good men sin, bad men sin. Perhaps bad men sin far more and far worse than good men, but guess what? Good men still sin too. David sinned. Now, who's going to stand up and say David was a wicked, evil, vile man? I don't really think anybody's going to stand up and say that. David sinned, and David was a good man. How do I know that? Well, in scriptures such as 1 Kings 9 and verse 4, we see Jehovah is speaking to Solomon, David's son. And this is after David's horrible sins of 2 Samuel 11 and really 2 Samuel 12. And it's also after David's death. And if you'll look at, at 1 Kings rather 9 and verse 4, you'll see that the Lord uses phrases like David having integrity of heart and David walking in uprightness. Now this is well after David's terrible, horrible sins with Bathsheba and he's been dead. And look how the Lord still speaks of him. But here's the point. Psalm 51, look at the title. It said to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he, David, had gone in to Bathsheba. Now, wasn't all he did, was it? That's part of it. He also had her husband killed, murdered, really. Terrible, terrible, horrible things that David did. Let me give you a quick breakdown. Psalm 51, 4, you see the repentance. In Psalm 51, 5 through 11, you see David seeking reconciliation. In Psalm 51, 12 to 19, he really desires restoration. For the sake of time, let's look at Psalm 51, verses 1 beginning. 
And again, notice all these personal pronouns. Notice all these things that are said. He says, have mercy upon, he doesn't say my neighbor, does he? He doesn't say have mercy on Nathan the prophet for what he came and told me. He understands, I did this, I did this. Have mercy upon me. Whatever has to happen with Nathan or whatever has to happen with everybody else in the world, that's between them and God. But look at what David says, have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out. He doesn't say my neighbor's transgressions. He's praying for whom? Himself. Over what? His personal transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge, he, what does he say? He doesn't stand up and say, you know what? Everybody else in the world is sin. Well, it's not, that, that doesn't really concern him, does it? It's between me and the Lord. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. That's beautiful. You know, one of the key things that we can all see from this and learn from it, and it seems that in our culture we've become professional dodgers. And professional blame gamers. When, when something comes, what do we do? We, we defer it. We default it. Well, I did it because of this or I did it because of that. David understood. I did it. I did wrong. I'm accepting responsibility for what I did. And Lord, be merciful unto me. Now, if we can't learn a lesson from that, I don't know what else we could learn. But look down to verse 9. Look how it continues. Hide thy face from, again, look at it. He doesn't say the world sins. He doesn't say my neighbor's sins. He doesn't say Bathsheba's sins. He says, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit, a right disposition within me. Cast, not, cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Meaning what? David was an inspired man. He understood that Saul, the first king of the United Kingdom of Israel, played around and played around. He found the edge and he crossed it. And things were never the same with Saul. David understood you're playing with sin. And when you play with sin, you always get burned. So you don't want to try to get to the edge. David understood that. You're getting close to the edge. You need to get back on solid ground. Repent of what's been done. Try to make it right as best as you can. And you've got to talk to the Lord about it. So what do we see about David? David wrote psalms of confession. And David certainly paid for his sins in this life. But what's the point? He took the necessary steps to make certain his eternity was secure. We read about him in Hebrews 11, incidentally. So apparently he made things right. Now four. David wrote psalms of Christ. Turn with me to Psalm 110. The 110th Psalm. And look at the title. It simply says, A Psalm of David. We don't know at what point in his life he probably was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this. But again, we already said Jesus quotes Psalm 110.1 and attributes it to David. What else do you want? How much clearer could that be? So again, while these ancient titles are probably not inspired, I don't know any of them that are incorrect. Now, salvation through Jesus Christ is the central theme of the whole Bible. I don't know anybody that would really deny that. Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm, and the New Testament applies this psalm to Jesus, and it was written from the inspired hand of David, Acts 2, 29 to 36, and other places. Now, when you look at Psalm 110, it seems to be entirely, 100%, totally messianic. So David wrote about it in the long ago, but he was talking about Jesus, the Christ, in the New Testament. Well, the Word of God is quick and powerful, so what good would a messianic psalm do in David's day and time? Well, it was simply this. Messianic psalms assured the Jews that God's promises to Abraham would occur. Despite going through captivities and ups and downs and everything else, these messianic psalms assured them that the Messiah would come, exactly how the Lord had promised. 
Now, Psalm 110 is about the dominion of the king. Who's the king? Jesus is the king. Verses 1 through 3, we see the people of the king. Verse 4, we see the priesthood of the king. And verses 5 through 7, we see the power of the king. Look with me in Psalm 110 and verse 3. Thy people, the king's people, shall be willing in the day of thy power. When's the day of the Lord's power? It's Acts chapter 2. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. It gives the idea of willingness. But look how it continues. Thou hast the dew of youth. So willingness and zeal were to be prerequisites to becoming a New Testament Christian. Don't you see that in Acts chapter 2? Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, even to as many as the Lord our God shall call them. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine of fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Acts 2, 36 through 42. What does Psalm 110, 3 look like? It looks like Acts 2, 36 through 42. That's exactly what it is. Look also at Psalm 110 and verse 4. Now where we see the people of the king, look at the priesthood of the king. This has been in the Bible. The Jews who were honest, perhaps even when Paul would expound from the Old Testament about the Lord, perhaps he would expound on psalms like this. Psalm 110. Verse 4 says, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent thou, the king, are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, one of the neat things about Melchizedek is that he was before the law of Moses. And then Abraham, who you want to look at as the father of the Hebrew people, so to speak, Abraham, while he walked on this planet as a man, there was a man who walked on this planet who was greater than Abraham. Well, the Jews in the first century especially thought, oh, there's never been anybody greater than Abraham. Oh, and the Mosaic law is just the law to end all laws. Well, oh, go back and look in the law of Moses. Look in the Old Testament. The coming Messiah was to be after the order of Melchizedek. No part, parcel, none at all of the law of Moses. Now, God cannot lie. According to Titus 1-2, he keeps his promises. Now, Jesus is indeed a priest, according to Hebrews 4, 14 and 15, but he is not a priest. After the order of Aaron, Hebrews 7, 11 to 14, you know what that proves? There was always something greater coming. The gospel has always been the eternal purpose of God. It wasn't just something that God threw together right after the crucifixion of Jesus to say, oh no, the Jews have rejected my only begotten son. What am I going to do? No, ma'am and no, sir. This was a well thought out plan before the foundation of the world. People didn't see it because they really didn't want to see it. For the same reason today, people don't see the truth about salvation in Christ, not because it's unable to be seen, but because they don't want to see it. They don't see the need or the desire to see it. Don't you see that we're under a better covenant with better promises? Hebrews 8, 6, with a better high priest. Well, we can learn a tremendous amount from the life and writings of David the sweet psalmist of Israel, can't we? Even though it's in the Old Testament, we can see a whole lot of things that are true. We can learn about creation. We can discover true comfort. We can learn how to confess sin. And most importantly, we can learn about Jesus, can't we? All from a man who was the youngest of eight sons and kept his father's sheep. Well, would you ever think that the Lord could use a man like that? Well, he did, and he used him mightily. You know what's the difference between David and perhaps many other people who've ever been? David loved the Lord. He loved the Lord enough to do exactly what the Lord said. When he made terrible mistakes, guess what? He made them right. Let me give you some bad news. Somewhere in your life, great or small or somewhere in between, we've sinned. We have missed the mark set by God. We can try and convince ourselves that 
this sin is not as bad as that sin or this sin or I didn't do this and I would never do that. But listen, when we sin, we're lost. We're lost. The only thing that can get rid of sins is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's it. How do we meet the blood of Jesus Christ? We've got to hear the truth. Romans 10, 17. We've got to believe the truth. John 8, 24. Jesus said, except you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. We must repent of sin, Acts 3, 19. It's tied to conversion. We must confess openly and freely that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. We must be immersed in water for the remission of sins to contact the soul-redeeming blood of the Lamb. Acts 22, 16, Revelation 1, 5. Then the Lord has added us to his church, and brethren, it's up to us to be faithful, to remain faithful unto death. 1 John 1, 9, wherever you are, come now. As together we stand as we sing the song of encouragement.